Hey guys, how's it going? Mr. Mitchell here. In this video, we're going to go over exactly what you need to know and be able to do for the Particles and Waves Part 1 topic in the Higher Physics exam. So let's get started. So for the Particles and Waves topic, remember I've split it into two parts. So we've got Particles and Waves Part 1, which is the first five subtopics, and then the three other subtopics for Particles and Waves Part 2 will be in a separate video. So the SQA split the Particles and Waves topic into eight main key areas, but we're going to focus on the first five in this video for Particles and Waves Part 1. So the five subtopics are Forces and Charged Particles, We've then got the standard model, we've then got nuclear reactions, the inverse square law, and lastly wave particle duality. So starting at the first one, forces and charged particles, you should know that charged particles experience a force in an electric field. So remember the definition of an electric field is a region around a charge in which another charge will experience a force. But remember charges cannot experience their own electric field. Then says to know that electric fields exist around charged particles and between charged parallel plates. And we looked at lots of examples which takes us to the next one. So you need to be able to sketch electric field patterns for single point charges, systems of two point charges and between two charged parallel plates. So you should know the electric field pattern for a single positive charge, a single negative charge, two opposite charges, so a positive and a negative charge near each other and two like charges, so it could be two negative charges near each other or two positive charges near each other. And you should also be able to sketch the pattern for two charged parallel plates where you've got a uniform field, remember, that's set up between the plates. And remember, the field lines will always go from positive to negative. You should also be able to determine the direction of movement of charged particles in an electric field. And remember, that's just through the simple rules of attraction or repulsion. You should also be able to define voltage, i.e. potential difference, in terms of work done and charge. And remember we can use this equation to help us. So if we rearrange this for V, i.e. the voltage or potential difference, then we get work done divided by the charge Q. So we could say that a work done of one joule will be done on one coulomb of charge when the potential difference between two plates is equal to one volt. And you should also be able to use appropriate relationships to solve problems involving the charge, mass, speed and energy of a charged particle in an electric field and the potential difference through which it moves. So you need to be able to use W equals QV, which is work done equals charge times potential difference, and the kinetic energy equation, EK equals a half mv squared. And it also helps to remember the important relationship that work done on a charged particle is equal to the change in kinetic energy. And that then lets you carry out calculations involving final kinetic energy and initial kinetic energy, where you could maybe calculate the speed of a particle, for example. Moving on, you should know that a moving charge produces a magnetic field. So remember moving charges, i.e. electrons in a wire, will produce a magnetic field around the wire in a circular pattern. And that circular magnetic field direction can be found using something called the left hand grip rule. So remember you point your thumb in the direction of the current i.e. the charge flow and your fingers in your left hand will curl round in the direction of the magnetic field. You should also be able to determine the direction of the force on a charged particle moving in a magnetic field for negative and positive charges. And remember this is done using the right hand rule, where the first finger or index finger gives the direction of the magnetic field, your second finger or middle finger gives the direction of the particle to begin with, and your thumb gives the direction of the motion or the force on the particle due to the magnetic field. And remember the right hand rule works for negative charges, but if you're doing a question with a positive charge instead, then that means that you need to flip your direction at the end, remember you need to reverse the direction. Lastly for section 1, you should know the basic operation of particle accelerators in terms of acceleration by electric fields, deflection by magnetic fields and high energy collisions of charged particles to produce other particles. And remember we looked at the different types of particle accelerators for that, so we did cathode ray tubes, linear accelerators, cyclotrons and synchrotrons. And then we also looked at the Large Hadron Collider as an example. Moving on to section 2 now, the standard model, you should know that the standard model is a model of fundamental particles and interactions. You should also be able to use orders of magnitude and have awareness of the range of orders of magnitude of length from the very small, i.e. the subnuclear, to the very large, such as the distance to the furthest known celestial objects. And remember orders of magnitude just means powers of 10, and using powers of 10 for numbers allows us to compare the relative sizes of things. Next, you should know that evidence for the existence of quarks comes from high energy collisions between electrons and nucleons carried out in particle accelerators. And you should know that in the standard model, every particle has an antiparticle, and that the production of energy in the annihilation of particles is evidence for the existence of antimatter. So for example, we saw that when you have an electron and its antiparticle, the positron, colliding with each other, then they annihilate each other and produce gamma rays. 
and these gamma rays carry away energy. So we say that it's this production of energy that provides evidence for the existence of antimatter. Moving on, you should be able to describe beta decay as the first evidence for the neutrino. And remember the beta decay reaction looks like this. So we've got a neutron converting into a proton plus an electron plus an electron antineutrino. And it helps to know the story of how the neutrinos were discovered. You also need to know that fermions, the matter particles, consist of quarks and leptons. And remember there's six types of quarks and there's six leptons as well. So for the six quarks we've got up, down, strange charm, top and bottom. And for the leptons we've got the electron, muon and tau particles together with their neutrinos. So we've got the electron neutrino, muon neutrino and tau neutrino. Next you should know that hadrons are composite particles made of quarks. So composite particles remember are the opposite to fundamental particles because composite particles are made up of other particles whereas fundamental particles are not, they are in their simplest form. You should also know that baryons are made of three quarks and that mesons are made of quark-antiquark -quark pairs and therefore only two quarks. Lastly, you should know that the force mediating particles are bosons and that we have photons for the electromagnetic force, W and Z bosons for the weak force and gluons for the strong force. But remember the graviton, the force mediating particle for the gravitational force is hypothetical, it's not yet been discovered. Moving on to section 3 for nuclear reactions, you should be able to use nuclear equations to describe radioactive decay, fission, both spontaneous and induced, and fusion reactions, with reference to mass and energy equivalents. You should also be able to use an appropriate relationship to solve problems involving the mass loss and the energy released by a nuclear reaction. So remember we have E equals mc squared where E is the energy released, m is the lost mass and c is the speed of light in a vacuum. Lastly, you should know that nuclear fusion reactors require charged particles at a very high temperature in a plasma which have to be contained by magnetic fields and this remember is called plasma containment. Moving on we have section 4, the inverse square law, and you should know that irradiance is the power per unit area instant on a surface. So that's your definition there. You should also be able to use an appropriate relationship to solve problems involving irradiance, the power of radiation instant on a surface and the area of the surface itself. So that is the equation I equals P over A. Next you should know that irradiance is inversely proportional to the square of the distance from a point source, otherwise known as an inverse square law. And you should be able to describe an experiment to verify the inverse square law for a point source of light. And remember the inverse square law for light tells us that as the distance from the light source, i.e. the point source, increases, that the irradiance will drop off rapidly, or as distance doubles, the irradiance quarters. And lastly, for section 4, you should be able to use an appropriate relationship to solve problems involving irradiance and distance from a point source of light. So we have I equals K over D squared, where I is your irradiance, K is a constant, and D is the distance. And remember, we can form this second equation from this first one. So when we're dealing with initial and final distances and irradiances, or first and second values, then we can say I1 D1 squared equals I2 D2 squared, where I1 and D1 are your initial irradiance and distance values, and I2 and D2 are your final irradiance and distance values. Lastly, we have section 5, wave particle duality. So firstly, you need to know that the photoelectric effect is evidence for the particle model of light. You should also know that photons of sufficient energy can eject electrons from the surface of metals, and this, remember, is called photoemission. And this whole process is called the photoelectric effect. But remember we need the energy of the instant photons in the metal to have a high enough energy greater than the work function of the metal and the instant photons also need to have a frequency greater than the threshold frequency of the material. As if these requirements are not met then no photo emission will take place, i.e. no electrons will be emitted from the metal surface. Next you need to be able to use an appropriate relationship to solve problems involving the frequency and energy of a photon. So remember we have E equals HF where E is the energy of the photon, H is Planck's constant and F is the frequency frequency of the photon. Next you need to know the definitions for threshold frequency and work function. So you should know that the threshold frequency is the minimum frequency of a photon required for photo emission and that the work function of a material is the minimum energy of a photon required to cause photo emission. And just to finish off, you should be able to use appropriate relationships to solve problems involving the mass, maximum kinetic energy and speed of photoelectrons, the threshold frequency of the material and the frequency and wavelength of the photons. So remember we've got this equation here which relates the maximum kinetic energy of ejected photoelectrons to Planck's constant, the frequency of the instant photons and the threshold frequency of the material. So that's Ek equals Hf minus Hf0. Or another way to think about this equation remember is that the maximum kinetic energy of the ejected photoelectrons is equal to the instant photon energy minus the work function of the metal. We also have the equation for kinetic energy here Ek equals a half mv squared where we could for example find the speed of ejected electrons 
And lastly, we have V equals F lambda, which allows us to relate the speed, frequency, and wavelength of the instant light. And remember, you could be expected to combine this equation with this one here, where, for example, you might know the speed of the instant photon as being the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8, and you might be given the wavelength of that instant light as well instead of the frequency. And if you know those two values, then you can substitute in for F here. So instead of EK equals HF minus HF naught, you could say EK equals HC over lambda minus HF naught. And remember, that's a top tip that we saw in one of the theory videos. That's all for this video, folks. Thanks for watching. If you made it to the end, I really appreciate it. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.